Good morning and uh, welcome to, I suppose it's day three, uh, lecture five uh, this morning and lecture six this afternoon. Now, in this part of the course I want to move on towards priority setting and how, how economic, economics, health economic methods can assist or inform the setting of priorities. Um, first of all, though, we should, uh, today's picture. This is a, is a rather famous picture. Um, it was Edvard Munch, a Norwegian artist who, um, a bit like uh, Kusama Yayoi, repeated themes. Uh, each picture is not different, it's sort of related. And this is, of course, called The Scream. And this, I, I, was, I was in uh, Oslo about two weeks ago at the Research Council for Norway, where I was doing some reviewing for them. And a bus went past with, <laughs> this is a bus, you can just, well, you may not know that's a, a, a light, <laughs> but it's part of the bus. And I thought, yes, for some people, the idea of using economics in priority setting brings on a scream because, as I touched on in the first lecture, there's a view that perhaps applying economics in the context of healthcare decision making is somehow wrong or unfair, or indeed some people would say unethical. And I just remind you, in, in, in that lecture, I ended by making the argument but I thought it, it was the other way around. It's unethical not to consider economic aspects. Now, I'm choosing my words carefully here. Unethical not to consider. I'm not saying you must use economics and the economics somehow takes your decision because it doesn't or it shouldn't. Uh, the other reason for the scream here is I am going to sort of teach you a little bit of economics this morning. Now, uh, I know for some of you that will bring on the, the, that inner scream, but we'll try and make it painless, okay? And so, in this lecture, what I'm, I'm really looking at is why we can't just leave it to the market. For many things in life, Food, bicycles, motor cars, hotels, accommodation, uh, holidays. We, we don't look to the government or government agencies to make decisions for us. We just get on and do things. And uh, we seem happy enough with the, with the results. But, so what I want to talk about in this lecture is why, a number of reasons why we may not be happy to leave things to the marketplace for, in healthcare. And that then sets up this afternoon's lecture, which is if you're not going to use the market, how are you going to take decisions? And that ties back to my argument in the first lecture. I think it's unethical not to consider the economics. And so in the afternoon, we'll take a couple of examples. We'll return to hepatitis C, uh, directly acting antivirals, and also um, we'll look at some of the new treatments for non-small cell lung cancer. And I'll try and show you how health economists have tried to approach uh, the issues. So that's what we're going to cover. It's quite a lot to cover, but we'll, we'll manage. And we'll still have plenty of time for comments, questions, observations. Well, under a number of assumptions, if markets are functioning perfectly, they will produce optimal outcomes. They are wonderful the creatures, the market. Seemingly without any effort or energy or resource, people coming together, people selling things, people d demanding, purchasing goods, services, coming together, the market almost magically produces a set, of, if it's functioning well, a set of outcomes which we might describe as optimal or cannot be improved upon. 
Now, if that's the starting point, and that's, that's where economists start, a belief in markets, the functioning of markets, why do most governments intervene? And when I say most, it's probably all governments, to some extent, intervene in the markets for healthcare. Sometimes they completely replace the market. Sometimes they'll ha allow a private market to coexist alongside a um, very regulated provision of, of health care. Well, in order to understand this, we have to understand, first of all, um, why markets might fail. Why markets might fail to give us good outcomes. Because if, if we were pretty convinced the market would work and give us good outcomes, why bother intervening? Why go to all the effort having large ministries of health and welfare? Or, I think you've got labour in your title as well. We have Department of Health. Why do we have these big structures, many, many agencies involved? Why not just leave it to the market? And this is what we're going to find out um, now. So what is a market? Well, a market takes many forms. Uh, of course, we think sometimes a very traditional market, a sort of marketplace with lots of stalls and individual individuals with the goods laid out, selling them, people coming by, examining them, looking at them, asking the price, going next door to another provider, asking, seeing what they've got, seeing what their price is. Well, that's a, that's a traditional market, but of course, they've evolved and we get now quite sophisticated markets, many where people never meet, uh, perhaps all taking place online. But all markets have the same essence, and what they are doing is they are a, a forum, a mechanism, whereby quantities and prices that are going to be supplied and demanded are, are formed. Now, markets are potentially highly efficient, uh, potentially a great way of organising economic activity. And I suppose as evidence for that, I could just point to all around us, so many parts of our human existence, we seem to be quite comfortable leaving things to the market. Now, it seems to be so efficient because it coordinates all the independent activities of all the many um, consumers, the purchasers, um, of all the providers or suppliers of goods and services. It seems to coordinate their activities, as I say, almost costlessly. And the way it does this is the prices that are set by the market, the quantities that are bought and sold, act as signals to the participants. Now, of course, there are alternatives to markets. You, one alternative is some sort of central planning where a government or government departments or agencies determine quantities, determine prices. But any of these alternative systems are likely to be much more costly to operate. Now, I am talking about markets that function well. And in order for markets to function well, there are a number of assumptions that we require. And I won't go through them all, but I'll highlight some of them. Perhaps, perhaps the most important one is something called atomistic competition. The idea is that any particular supplier of, of goods or services, it's called a firm, any particular firm, makes up only a small part of the overall supply. They are just a small part of the total that's being supplied. The implication of their being a small part is that they are what we call price takers. Any one firm, any one individual cannot choose the price <coughs> independently of everybody else because they're such a small part of the market. Another assumption we usually make is firms are trying to maximise profits. Um, that doesn't seem a very strong assumption, but actually there are other things firms might choose to maximise. Um, they might try to maximise their size, because the owner likes 
to be on top of a big firm rather than a nearly big firm. I don't know. But generally speaking, we're assuming there's a, some ma profit maximization motive driving decisions. Now, a very important assumption, and of course, this has a direct link in to um, healthcare. We assume that consumers are well informed. And in the marketplace, this means that they are able to find the lowest price. Or when they see a price, they can identify, is it the lowest price? Or could I do better somewhere else? Or not? Um, more than that, they're able to judge the quality of what they're purchasing. Now, we probably like to think that when we're shopping for food or something, we're not too bad at this. You know, we pick up the avocado, squeeze very gently, is it almost ripe or not? Uh, sometimes just by looking at something or by its smell, we can say, yes, this is good quality or, well, it's not such good quality, and we can allow for that. Of course, healthcare, and m many of you have medical training, even those with medical training, it's not an easy task to assess quality of healthcare. As a researcher, it's not an easy task either to assess quality. What about the consumer, or sometimes call them patients? How easy is it for them to know when they're getting good health service or less good health service? And so there's a, an early signal why maybe the marketplace isn't going to be satisfactory or entirely satisfactory for allocating health care because the sort of information that we require or we assume for a market to function well, that information may be lacking. And I'm not even talking here of some patients who have, shall we say, diminished decision-making capacity. I'm thinking here of patients who are able to make decisions perfectly well in many aspects of life, but when it comes to healthcare, they find it harder. We also assume that consumers try to maximize utility. Well, what does that mean? Simply that as individuals, when they choose A or B, they choose what they believe will be best for them. That might be a less strong assumption. Um, there's an issue, sometimes we choose what's good for somebody else. But when we're consuming goods or services ourselves, it doesn't seem a very strong assumption that we're trying to get what's best for us. Um, another, and this is an important assumption, and this will tie back into social capital, which of course we've been discussing for a couple of days. Uh, there are no externalities. Now I'll, I'll explain externalities more fully in a minute, but an externality in brief is a situation where my action in possibly consuming a particular good has consequences for me but it also has consequences for other people and when I take my decision I'm not adequately reflecting the consequences for others that's basically what an externality is but I'll say a bit more about it um, we don't need externalities to have perfect competition but we do need externalities if competitive markets are to give us these um, optimal outcomes. So, a little bit, that's that bit. Um, market um, demand curve is simply the summation of all the individual demands. So, if we're thinking of the market for anything, the size of that market can be captured by the demand curve. It shows a relationship between price and the quantity that people want to purchase. And the market demand curve is just the sum of all the individual demands that different households or individuals have. And so the market demand curve shows um, at each price what quantity will be demanded. And the key thing here is with very few exceptions, very few exceptions, we expect 
larger quantities to be demanded at lower prices. So if the price falls, we expect demand to rise. And this is what gives us a downward sloping demand curve from left to right. Supply curve, well, the supply curve, um, well, for firms in a competitive market, they're price taking. So what they have to decide is, given the price they, they, can, they can obtain for their good or service, what quantity do they want to provide? That's their decision. And that gives us a supply curve for the firm. As the price rises, we expect firms to want to supply more. It comes back to profit maximization. And so we get an upward sloping supply curve from left to right. Um, we can explain this a bit more fully in terms of all sorts of economic concepts which we don't need to go into, uh, diminishing marginal productivity and things like that. But a firm, if it's profit maximizing and it's a price taker, it chooses the quantity, how many the quantity of services to provide or quantity of goods, it chooses the quantity where price is equal to marginal cost because that maximizes profit. But we, we, we don't need all that. We just, I just, it's just irresistible for me to say there is reasons why I can assert that we expect upward sloping supply. So, decision on what output to supply. Now, if a firm has some market power, we sometimes call it a monopolist if it's a single seller, if it has some market power, it ceases to be a price taker and becomes a price setter. So if it's large enough relative to the market, it no longer has to follow the market, accepting the price in the market, it can choose the price. So for example, just trying to think of, um, I'm, I see an Epson projector in front of me. Now I don't know what size of the market for projectors Epson has, but I suspect it's large enough that it has a degree of market power. It doesn't just have to see what price is established in the market and follow that price. It can choose what price it wishes to charge. The implication of this is quite important. If you can set your own price, you've now got a choice about what quantity to sell. You could set a high price and sell a bit less in terms of quantity, or you could set a lower price, sell a bit more. Now, that's different from the price taker who simply is given a price and they choose um, what level of quantity will maximize their profit. They choose the quantity. For this power monopolist in the extreme case, or just in general for a firm with market power, it's now got a different decision. It's got price and quantity it can choose. And so what it has to look at is the marginal revenue. Um, it's the change in the revenue, change in the, if you like, the income it's getting, or the money it's getting from selling goods. It's the change in their income or revenue as they sell an additional unit. But to sell an additional unit, you have to lower your price.